by Bank of Uganda. On the request to Bank of Uganda as the, last, as the end of the last resort, the Auditor General noted on page 44, paragraph 3, that on 16th October 2016, Credmark applied for a facility of $115 million from Bank of Uganda as a lender of last resort to help sort out Grand Bank's immediate and long-term liquidity. On 17th October, Bank of Uganda assessed the application and approved a maximum facility of 79.2 billion shillings payable over a one-year period for a date from the date of the offer in quarterly installments at an interest rate of uh, CBR plus 5%, and that the facility shall solely be secured by third party collaterals of substantial value, and the Bank of Uganda will not accept branch, branch premises as security for the loan, for the loan facility. As noted above, whereas the shareholders and the directors of Green Bank made every effort to address the challenges of the bank. Bank of Uganda frustrated all the said efforts and then decided to take over the bank and sold it to their preferred buyer. At the time of closure, Green Bank shareholders had contributed a loan of $8 million, that's approximately 27 billion shillings. Bank of Uganda demanded that the said amounts be deposited in Bank of Uganda and not in Crane Bank. However, to date, no explanation of the whereabouts of this money has been offered to the shareholders. In our consternation as directors, rather than responding to our letter, to our letter of 19th October, 2016, Bank of Uganda took over the management of the bank, of Ukraine Bank on the same day at 11.49 p.m. I've already talked about this uh, notice on the website, which is as an Annex L. This was on the same day that we had written accepting their proposal to take their loan. It is also worth noting that the taking over of the management of Green Bank was done three days after third party security was offered to Bank of Uganda to secure the loan. This means that the efforts of the shareholders and directors were completely ignored and never considered in favor of a premeditated pre plan to take over the bank. What options did the Bank of Uganda have? Bank of Uganda had two options. Either it lends money to Crane Bank or takes over the bank and injects the money in the bank and manages it. The first option would have ensured the Bank of Uganda was repaid and over 700 jobs saved and the financial sector would remain undisturbed. The option had not just Bank of Uganda money secured by the bank's branches, but also ensured that the money was secured by other collateral. The shareholders could also have been encouraged to accelerate the process of obtaining the equity partners to inject capital in the Crane Bank. This resolution would have gone a long way in saving a Ugandan business. This was especially important since the shareholders had run the bank successfully for over 20 years and had a good understanding of the local market. The second option, Bank of Uganda elected instead to take over the bank, run it, close it, and sell its assets without any shareholders' involvement and even without proper valuation. On 20th October 2016, Bank of Uganda took over the management of Crane Bank. Did Bank of Uganda plan to save Crane Bank? The Auditor General on page 44, page 54, paragraph 4 of his report, 
found out that the Bank of Uganda had no plan to revive the bank. The Auditor General specifically states that on 10th April, I requested for the reports of the statutory manager and details of the funds injected in Queen Bank prior to takeover. Purpose of injection, amount to be injected, procedures and approvals of the injection, recovery plan, and how the injected funds were to be managed. To establish the efforts taken by the Secretary Manager to revive Queen Bank. Bank of Uganda did not provide a plan or assessment detailing efforts to return the bank into compliance with the prudential standards despite funding despite the funding of 478.8 billion being injected in Ukraine Bank. In absence of the plan or assessment to revive Ukraine Bank, the Auditor General said I could not provide assurance as to whether Section 89.5 and 94C of the FIA 2004 were complied with. It is important to note that the Auditor General's report on page 45, there was a capital gap of 140 million, 130 million. However, Bank of Uganda took over management and spent 478 billion. <coughs> it is also worth noting that Bank of Uganda hired PWC to do the inventory. The inventory manager took over Crane Bank on 20th October. The inventory was prepared, was presented to the statutory manager on 21st December 2016, and the bank was sold on 25th January 2017. Bank of Uganda did not therefore rely on the PWC inventory report to decide to sell the assets of the bank because the inventory came long after the commencement of statutory management. The Auditor General points out that Bank of Uganda invited bids for the sale of assets and assumption of liabilities on 12th of December 2016 and the bid's closing date was 20th December 2016. The Auditor General on page 45, paragraph 2, further notes that in his, this in his report that on 28th October, Bank of Uganda engaged PwC to compile inventory of assets and liabilities of Crane Bank as of 20th September, as of 20th October, the date of the takeover. Subsequently, PwC prepared an inventory report which was submitted to Bank of Uganda on 21st December 2016. Therefore, Bank of Uganda bids were received and processed one day before Bank of Uganda received the inventory list. To use the inventory on 21st December in 2016 as the basis for actions taken in October 2016 is incomprehensible. The plan, therefore, was not to lend Crane Bank money, not to attempt to save the business, but to take it over, asset strip the bank, and sell it to a preferred buyer. If Crane Bank was undercapitalized to the extent claimed by Bank of Uganda, then the assets of Crane Bank would not have increased the assets of DFCU from 1.8 trillion to 3 trillion. This is an increase of over 67 percent in the assets of DFCU. This can be found in the prospectus of DFCU of March 2017. <coughs> Bank of Uganda funds. The Auditor General found that the central bank claims to have injected 478 billion in Ukraine Bank, which was made up of 466 billion purportedly, purportedly as liquidity support, while 12 billion went to Bank of, Uganda, Bank of Uganda lawyers and auditors, among other professionals. However, the Auditor General noted that. There was no documentation regarding the injection and the expenditure of this money. We have not been informed about 
where the money came from, where it was spent to date, and who approved it. The Auditor General Report <coughs> on page 54, paragraph 7, notes that I observed that Bank of Uganda did not have a documented process of injection of funds to support current bank operations during the statutory management. And at page 56, paragraph 2, the Auditor General notes that in assessing the above, I was unable to examine current bank's operations during the statutory management to determine that the funds injected reflected the liquidity shortfall at that time. Although I was able to review and verify the approved request for liquidity, for liquidity support together with the, the supporting schedules, I did not review payments made by current bank to the bona fide account holders and all respective beneficiaries using the injected funds. <coughs> Therefore, the Auditor General was unable to see which accounts had been paid. The entire sum of 478 billion, 478, Uganda, 478 billion Uganda shillings is therefore unaccounted for. As a result, it's not clear who actually, who, who was actually being paid the money by Bank of Uganda claims to have injected in Korean Bank, and on which account this money was paid. This is the most serious, serious reason Bank of Uganda did not have Korean Bank audited for the year 2016. There were no financial reports, and certainly no audited report signed by the statutory manager or by any official Bank of Uganda and the bank auditors KPMG. The Auditor General noted on page 14, paragraph 2, that the statutory manager prepared current bank annual report and financial statements for the year ended 31st December 2016. But these were neither signed by Bank of Uganda nor by the auditors. Therefore, the statutory manager did not provide the financial statements for the period. Furthermore, the statutory manager did not provide financial statements for the period of 1st January to 25th January, the date for the P&A completion. I was therefore unable to ascertain the financial performance of Grand Bank Limited during the statutory management and its financial position as at 25th January 2017. He said this because there were no audited accounts and there were no supporting documents of what the uh, secretary manager did. <coughs> After spending almost 12 billion on the services of lawyers and auditors, Bank of Uganda was still unable to produce the audit report or have its expenditure audited by a third party. Bank of Uganda now seeks a refund of this money from the shareholders without any legal basis. Recovery of the amount injected into Crane Bank. The Auditor General noted that under Section 94 of the FIA 2014, uh, 2004, Bank of Uganda could only recover the money it injected into Crane Bank from the financial institution, not from the shareholders. In filing, in filing cases against the shareholders, Bank of Uganda incurred unnecessary and exorbitant costs. Bank of Uganda appointed conflict lawyers, conflicted lawyers, namely Max and Bowman's A.F. Mpanga advocates, who were barred from representing Bank of Uganda in any, in any matters against the shareholders. As a result, Bank of Uganda had to appoint new lawyers at exorbitant costs, which Bank of Uganda wants the shareholders to pay. It is a copy of this ruling on the conflicted lawyers, which we have attached as Annex M. We have noted a number of anomalies in the intervention costs by Bank of Uganda, that Bank of Uganda claims that it, inc that it incurred. For instance, at page 59, the, attorney, the Auditor General states that part of the intervention costs included 15% commission paid to Max as recovery costs. 
Well, Sorry, well, five percent. Five percent commission paid to Max as a recovery cost. There was no recovery. Even if Max had conducted a recovery, why would this money form part of the recovery cost? The five percent cost the five percent should have been deducted from the money recovered and therefore it's not an intervention cost. We reject the bill of Max advocates because they were conflicted as ruled by the High Court and should never have, been, have participated in any action against us. <clears throat> More importantly, according to Utah General's report, Max advocates were paid for the transaction advisory service in, 20, in November 2016. The payment was for advice on the sale of Crane Park. This in effect means that by November 2016, Bank of Uganda had already determined it wanted to sell the bank. A copy of Max invoice is attached as Annex N. At page 58 of the Auditor General's report, there is a payment to PwC for the inventory and forensic audit. However, it should be noted that under section 104 of the FIA, it provides that in the exercise of, in the exercise of its powers as a liquidator, the central bank or its appointed agent shall make a forensic investigation to determine the causes of failure of the financial institution and report on, among other things, among other things significant related party transactions, violations of the law, <coughs> and the institution's governing policies and regulations, and unsound business and lending practices. Under FIA, only the liquidator could conduct a forensic audit, not the, station, not the statutory manager. This obligation was not one that the statutory manager had the powers to conduct. We therefore do not agree that Crane Bank should be responsible for the payment. For the, payment. the amounts so determined have not been accounted for. And in many instances, the amounts are inexplainable. More importantly, the law states that the money should be recovered from Crane Bank. However, Bank of Uganda has stripped Crane Bank of all its assets, has imposed on it unnecessary and exorbitant costs. <coughs> the sale. According to the Max invoice, Bank of Uganda had decided to sell Crane Bank by November 2016. Therefore, Bank of Uganda did not plan to revive Crane Bank because by 2016, they were already working modalities of how to sell it off. This was contrary to section 89.5 of the FIA, which provides that the central bank shall exercise statutory management of a financial institution for the minimum time necessary to bring the financial institution into compliance with prudential standards. Bank of Uganda had no policies and guidelines in conducting the sale of Green Bank. According to the Auditor General, on page 48 of paragraph 2, he notes that I observed there were no guidelines, regulations, policies in place to guide the identification of the purchasers of defunct banks. Bank of Uganda did not support the activity. Bank of Uganda did not support, but, act, <coughs> but actively frustrated the efforts of Ukraine bank shareholders to bring strategic investors. The central bank instead opted for the sale of assets and liabilities of Crane Bank. Buyers were invited on 12th December 2016 and bids were closed on 20th December 2016. Bank of Uganda informed the Auditor General that the bidders were given the inventory report. This is illogical. Since the inventory report was dated 21st December, a day after the bidding had closed. No serious buyer can commit to buy a bank of assets 1.8 trillion in a space of seven days. This was a deliberate, this was a deliberate elimination of other bidders. 
<coughs> After deliberately frustrating other bidders, Bank of Uganda prefer prefer preferentially selected DFCU Bank Limited as the buyer. The aforementioned is substantiated by the fact that there were no minutes regarding the sale. At page 48, paragraph 5, the Auditor General notes that, however, I was not provided with the negotiation and minutes leading to the P&A agreement. In the absence of guidelines and negotiation minutes, I could not determine how Bank of Uganda selected the best evaluated bidder and how the terms of the P&A were determined. The Auditor General noted that Bank of Uganda did not value the assets of the bank but instead relied on DFCU's evaluation. This is contrary to section 95.3 of FIA, which provides in determining, which provides that in determining the amount of assets that is likely to be realized from the financial institution's assets, the receiver shall evaluate the alternatives on a present day value basis using a realistic discounted rate. The document, uh, or docu or, uh, document the evaluation and the assumption on which the evaluation is based, including any assumptions with regard to interest rates, asset recovery rates, inflation, asset holding, and other costs. Specifically on the issue of valuation, the Auditor General states that, states at page 49, paragraph 3, that I noted that Bank of Uganda did not carry out any valuation of the assets and liabilities of Crane Bank. Bank of Uganda explained that it had relied on the valuations and inventory of their preferred buyer, DFCU, to determine the price sale. This would in effect mean that they failed to maximize value contrary to the mandatory requirements of the FIA. Section 95.2 of the FIA provides that the central bank shall take the action described in subsection 1, which is the option of the central bank, which, is the opinion, which in the opinion of the central bank, A, is most likely to result in marshalling the greatest amount of the financial institution's assets. At page 50, paragraph 2 of the Auditor General's report states, in a meeting with the outgoing EDS on the progress of the special audit held on 13th December, sorry, 13th June 2018 at Bank of Uganda, the EDS explained that Bank of Uganda relied on the inventory report and due diligence and taken by DFCU to arrive at the P&A agreement. It is illogical and inconceivable that a person selling an asset can rely on the inventory, on the inventory or valuation done by the buyer to set on the terms of the agreement, especially after eliminating other bidders. DFCU preferred buyer, and in collusion with Bank of Uganda, agreed to take over the assets in exchange for taking over the liabilities and would pay 200 billion shillings over that nine months with no interest to settle the alleged Bank of Uganda loan. DFCU, in its prospectus dated March 2017, has referred to this as a bargaining purchase. <coughs> the assets that DFCU took over in the P&A agreement do not include the bad book of loans that had been provided for and written off at the date of transfer to DFCU. The bad book is an off-balance sheet. DFCU can only, DFCU only took those assets that were still on the balance sheet of print bank at the time of sale. See the definition of assets in the P&A agreement. The bad book had been removed from the asset side of print bank balance sheet in exchange for the removal of the shareholders' capital on the credit side of the Crane Bank balance sheet. This bad book essentially wiped out the shareholders' capital in Crane Bank. 
This means, therefore, that the shareholders paid for it with their capital and retained earnings, and therefore it belongs to them. This bad book of 570 billion shillings should be returned to the shareholders. Bank of Uganda deliberately tried to mislead the Committee of Parliament by suggesting that DFC was paying 200 billion for the bad book. This is completely false and does not stand up to close scrutiny. Section 14A, sorry, 14.1 of the P&A agreement makes clear that the P&A is the full agreement between the parties and there is no other agreement between the FCU and Crane Bank, Stroke Bank of Uganda, on the matter of Crane Bank assets. Because the P&A does not transfer the bad book to the FCU, and because there is no any other agreement between the parties, then the FCU has no legal basis to hold this bad book and collect on it. When it was entirely outside the P&A agreement, under which he took over the assets of Green Park. <clears throat> we have also noted that for all other bank, other bank res resolutions except in the case of Green Park, Bank of Uganda deliberately entered into special agreements to deal with the bad book and how it would be treated. It is therefore surprising that in the case of Green Bank, which is the most current case, they could just keep quiet about the largest bad book of, all, of them all. And if Bank of Uganda had intended to sell the bad book to DFCU, the P&A agreement would have said so, or a separate agreement on the bad book would have said so. The other general said it was unclear how 200 billion was arrived at as a consideration, especially since no valuation was done. The 200 billion would be paid over 39 months. It was also interest-free payment. Yet, Crane Bank stakeholders had asked for a loan and were to pay interest, but it was rejected. <coughs> as Bank of Uganda is paying interest to DFCU, as such, sorry, as such, Bank of Uganda is paying interest to DFCU on the Treasury bills pledged as security, while DFCU is not paying any interest to Bank of Uganda. It should be noted that DFCU secured 200 billion with Treasury bills held in Bank of Uganda, which Bank of Uganda was to create a year in over. However, the earlier request by Grand Bank to use the same Treasury bills as a year was rejected. As a result of the, DSF, of the DFCU transaction, the Auditor General on page 61, paragraph 2, notes that. However, I note that the agreement did not provide for interest on outstanding debt despite the long repayment period. As a result, Bank of Uganda recognized a, lot of, a loss of $39.478 billion. Bank of Uganda, in conducting a sale, and not including a payment of interest, it had suffered a loss of 39.7 billion, which loss it wants to pass now to the, it, which loss it now wants to pass to the shareholders. Yet the shareholders were not a party to the P and A agreement. The, the shareholders of Crane Bank. We have informed this honourable committee that during the pre-takeover stage, we tried to obtain a loan from Bank of Uganda. And this was rejected by taking over the bank. However, three months down the road, Bank of Uganda granted DFCU an interest-free loan, which resulted in the Bank of Uganda booking a loss. According to the General, Auditor General's report, the financial statement on Bank of Uganda for the year ended 30th June 2017. <clears throat> the report is attached as Annex O. As the amount due from DFC is interest-free and recoverable over 10 quarterly installments over a two-and-a-half-year period, commencing on the third quarter of 2017, the outstanding balance was discounted and recognized at its present value of 160 billion point five two two, 
has disclosed in note 22. This difference of 39.478 was recognized as a loss. Even after claiming to sell Crane Bank assets, even after claiming to sell Crane Bank assets for Uganda 200 billion, the Auditor General has since discovered that, in fact, the amounts had been discounted, and as a result, Bank of Uganda recognized the present value of 160 billion. Therefore, on day one, DFC was already making a profit of 39 billion to the prejudice of Korean Bank Limited. It is also worth noting that the process of sale of the assets and liabilities of Korean Bank commenced in November 2016. However, this sale concluded on January, on 25th January 2017, when the bank was under receivership. It should be noted that Korean Bank was placed under a one-day receivership before the sale of 24, or 24th January 2007. We refer to Bank of Uganda statement on the sale of Bank of, of Great Bank assets to DFCU attached as an P. This transaction worth 1.8 trillion was concluded in 24 hours from the date of placing a credit bank under receivership. Therefore, the placing of the bank under receivership was in order to strip credit bank of its assets. Under section 89.2.1 of the, of the FIA, during the structured management, Bank of Uganda could only sell the financial institution and not strip the assets, and not, uh, not, as, not, not asset strip. The placing of Crane Bank under receivership was only done for purposes of asset stripping. The blatant disregard of due process and the nature of the sale of Crane Bank assets was suspicious and only done to the prejudices of shareholders. Bank of Uganda therefore handled the takeover, manage, the takeover management and sale of Crane Bank in an illegal and professional manner. Mr. Chairman, I want to share with my colleagues this statement. Uh, can I ask Dr. Sudiu to read the balance? Sorry? Can I ask my colleague Dr. Sudiu to read the balance? <laughs> oh, the remainder of the statement. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Chairman Kosasis. Um, with your permission, Chairman, I'd like to ask for the following remedies. First and foremost, BOU should return the bad book, return off provisional loans that is illegally collected by DFCU. The bad book return off provision was paid by the shareholders of Crane Bank Capital and therefore belongs to the shareholders. According to DFCU members, the bad book is valued at 570 billion page 51 of Auditor General's report. And furthermore, DFC is holding this as an off-book record. It's completely illegal and under the um, letter written by BOU allowing it to happen. Where is that letter? Um, is it one of the next chairs? No, unfortunately not here. Um, okay. We'll, we draw that. Okay. You, you know, this committee works more or less like a court. We work on evidence. If you are referring to a letter which is not on record, okay. um, we don't p place serious uh, note of it. Number two, um, BOE should return all the money that the shareholders advance to Crane Bank as shareholders' loan. Prior to takeover, the shareholders lent Crane Bank $8 million, and after the takeover, the shareholders remitted $15.5 million to BOU. The total amount is $23.5 million. 
The purpose for, for which this money was advanced was frustrated by BOU. Therefore, BOU has no basis to keep it. This money should be returned to the shareholders. A, a market valuation should be conduct, conducted of assets and liabilities. They were sold to DFCU. To date, no one knows the list and, and the values of assets and liabilities sold to DFCU. Any excess value to the assets should be returned to Crime Bank Limited. There should also be a valuation of the goodwill and the business DFCU took over as a preferred buyer. DFCU got 46 branches, became the third largest bank overnight, and also got deposits worth 1.3 trillion, as per the audited financials of 2015. DFCU also got about 600,000 active accounts. The said businesses had a value that should be audited and its price returned to the shareholders. As shareholders, we want accountability for the money that BOU claims it purported to have injected in Crane Bank. We seriously believe this money, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of this money never ended up in Crane Bank. BOU should provide report from the statutory manager and the receiver as required by law. Parliament should order refund of professional fees from Max, KPMG, PwC, which have been paid, especially the lawyers have since been found to be conflicted. Crane Bank used to insure its deposits and pay into deposit protection fund. The DPP should have been first called in order to pay the depositors. However, Bank of Uganda opted for liquidity support to pay depositors. BOU should therefore refund the money contributed by the shareholders into the, into the uh, deposit protection fund. The receivership should be ended to avoid remaining in perpetuity in receivership like Greenland Cooperative and the bank should be returned to the shareholders. Um, Um, in conclusion, um, it's clear that BOU mishandled the issues of Crane Bank in violation and complete disregard of the provision of FIA. BOU disregarded the interests of its employees, shareholders, customers, and the economy. As a result, the economy was adversely affected by its action and the shareholders lost an investment that built over 20 years. Um, my also humble wish is, although it's not on a report, is to look at how recommendation will be, you know, uh, suggested by the committee to help regular central banks so in the future these things don't happen. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> that's the max the end of our statement. But uh, we have also learned, Mr. Chairman, that there were some comments by the NBC, the former bank, National Bank of uh, Commerce, as regards to the appropriate time. There will never be an appropriate time other than this one. Okay, can I ask my colleagues still to, to make uh, shareholders on the comments? Do we have it here? Yes, it's, it's shareholders on comments made by NBC that relate to Crane Bank. Purchase of assets and assumption of liabilities. Our brothers in arms at NBC have expressed some concern about CBR in relation to NBC assets. To address this concern, we'd like to clarify. A. Uh, can we have the record clear? NBC's National Bank of Commerce colleagues, I remember they appeared here the other day, 
and they had their own views which they expressed, but also they appear in the Auditor General's report. Proceed. Uh, thank you, Chairman. A. Crane Bank was not interested in acquiring the assets of NBC. B. Crane Bank Limited did not bid for these assets. C. Crane Bank was compelled to acquire these assets by the then EDS Justin Baganda. So. <laughs> D. She did this over telephone. She called up the Crane Bank MD and informed that she was directing Grand Bank to acquire these assets. She wasn't asking, it was an order from the authority. Mr. Kalan called up the members of the board and informed us of the directive following which we signed up the purchase of assets and assumption of libraries agreement, which we had paid for. Grand Bank never asked for this land and was not interested in it at all. As a matter of fact, the land was never been transferred to Grand Bank. It's still lying with Central Bank. Annex B to the agreement, Annex A and B sets out deposit and liabilities. And, 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 and in effect, what Crane Bank bought, what bad book was not transferred to Crane Bank Limited. Instead, it was left as an asset in an escrow allowance in accordance with Section 7.2 of PN Agreement. Purchase of discounted foreign currency. We also want to state for record. Crane Bank has never been offered and has never purchased any foreign exchange from anybody at a discounted price from anyone. B. There's no reference to this anywhere in the PN agreement and any suggestion to this effect is completely false. Ch Thank you, Chairman. Well, Thank you very much, uh, Korean Bank team. Colleagues, you have attentively listened to the submission by the former shareholders and directors of Korean Bank. Uh, they are seated in the same room with the <laughs> with the FCU. I wish I knew this was going to be the presentation. I would have called them on different days. But uh, maybe it is also okay that the FCU listen to it as it is. Uh, I will first of all direct that the presentation given by Crane Bank should be given to the FCU. Okay? Maybe you may have to have a few uh, clarifications to make. Uh, who is leading the DFCU delegation? I asked who? What's your name? Mr. Jimmy Mugera. May I, the chairman DFCU, may I request that you are officially given this presentation? Because it mentioned you several times such that when we, we, have, we interrupt, you will have time to have gone through what is stated herein. Okay. Colleagues, there you are. That is the presentation being made. May I proceed? Chair. Procedure? Yes. Chair. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I, I want to thank Rinpa for this. It is a comprehensive document. To me, it informs us a lot on what, on the face of it, transpired in this process. But not only this process, generally how business is conducted in Bank of Uganda around. So, and liquidation of it is a big document. I wonder whether it is not procedurally correct, Mr. Chairman, that we give the next one and a half hours to read and internalize this document.
before we resume our interaction with Queen Bank. Uh, in all fairness, because the document came in when we were seated here, but we need to interpret this document more comprehensively before we start asking questions and doing further interaction. Is it not procedure right that you give us at least the next one and a half hours to come back at two and we start on it? Mr. Chairman, I have an objection to that before you make your ruling. First of all, this uh, presentation refers to the Auditor General's report. We have had it for a long time. Two, we have keenly followed the presentation. My view is that we, proce we proceed, finish this, and handle other businesses. We don't have time to wait. Can I see the hands up and I know who I pick next? Hono Shila, Betty, Hono Namayanj. In that order. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think we've been following uh, the presentation and it highlights some of the things that we have already seen as we interacted with Bank of Uganda. It only serves to confirm and maybe to raise a few new issues. I think the important thing is to hear from DFCU and then we make our conclusions. Chair, we proceed. Florence. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and, um, and members, I want to support uh, Honorable Seguna that we give our t ourselves time to look at what Bank of Uganda has already submitted, what we have just received, so that we are able to inform ourselves. Because the presentation by Crane Bank has brought in a lot more than what we expected. That is my humble appeal to members, uh, that we give ourselves not only one and a half hours, maybe two hours. Vincent. Thank you, Chair. I would like to second my colleague, my nearest neighbor here, that we proceed, because the issues are not really new. We are only making a comparative analysis of what we've already discussed with the OU. And really for fairness, and we, in view of the fact that we do not have enough time, we proceed. Only if we have new issues we can raise and the, the, two, the, the, the people who are here can clarify them. So we proceed, Mr. Chairman. I second the idea of proceeding. Abraham and then Peter. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I, I totally disagree with my young brother. On our so gonna let us proceed. He looks older than you, though. So. Yeah, he's a bad, bad feeding. <laughs> uh, yesterday we received the LXT presentation from other camp, from other banks, and we went ahead. Let us try to be neutral and not have give preferential treatment to anybody. What has been said here, a lot of it we had with the, when we met the Bank of Uganda. And uh, so, in my view, Mr. Chairman, let us proceed. The point has been made, Peter. Thank you, Chair. Chair, me, I'm in support of Sagana's view. Let us give ourselves an hour and a half or two. We, enter, we internalize the document because really they have been reading it, but we have to internalize and we, because there are very many new issues which have come up in this document. It is a request from colleagues that we come back maybe as a two and then. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, though when you said Moses, I was wondering whether it was me or some other. Moses Jr. 
But Mr. Chairman, I want to support the argument that we treat our witnesses equal. But also, we maintain a consistency. Yesterday, we got two volumes of a Bible size each. After listening, like we've been listening, we went into clarifications from the witnesses. Today we are getting half, actually a quarter of what we received. The reference to the Auditor General's report, the report is ours. The Auditor General reported to Parliament and we know all these. We can only now seek clarification from the witness, the witnesses, but maintain consistency because this is what we've been doing to the rest of the witnesses, but also for equal treatment. We should not have a Korean bank different from other banks. We should not have any other banks different from Korean bank. So I support the argument that we proceed just like we've been doing. Hey, chairman, chairman, I want to propose that since we have had the presentation from CPA and DFCU has also been following, I want to suggest that we have a presentation from the DFCU so we can then find what we oh, no, Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, you gave so much time, up to two hours, of listening to the presentation, of over one hour of listening to the presentation of Green Bank. And uh, ordinarily, we could have said you summarize in five minutes. So the fact that we gave all the time to listen, and all the annexures are here. And uh, I would want to plead with my learned friend, Sekona, that it should be a little easier for us advocates to, to throw our questions in any circumstances. Because if we sleep over this, or give it more time, there are other parties who are outside this house who may be consulted. So let's just treat it, Mr. Chairman, I submit, we treat it very innocently as we have received it. And, uh, and then secondly, if you could use your chair, since most of the issues, almost 60%, heads towards DFCU, I don't know what you would guide as the chair, if probably DFC will take the front seat because some of the questions will ask. Some people would better be placed to have answers. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. But I, I would be against the idea of uh, adjourning even for, for 10 minutes because this is an, this is an era of, of, of mobile phones. Let us just take the presentation the way it has been made. Thank you. Dear November Kazi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to propose that we proceed because most of these things, they, the representation they have given us, we have actually, ha we had this, this information in the, the General's report, except for a few instances, but uh, I'm sure both parties are here which are concerned. So my view is that we proceed and don't waste time. We have to finish this report. Actually, they are not both parties. There are supposed to be three parties. The DOU, Crane Bank, and the FC. Yes, so Nova Balland, we close this. Do you really, are you going to raise anything which has not been raised before? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you so much and uh, I want to thank uh, CBL for the report. Now, I, I just thought to just inquire the spirit behind the extension or the adjournment from Honorable Shekona. If that was clearly explained, maybe I would understand. But at this stage, since we have been discussing the issue to deal with the closure of banks, 
from last year. There is no reason why we should even extend by one minute. Because we know that agenda is mentioned here, so DFCU is mentioned here, the National Bank of Commerce is being mentioned. In my view, Madam, uh, Mr. Chairman, let's proceed and discuss this matter, unless otherwise no. my senior brother here has something, uh, the, the purpose as why, well, wants us to extend it. watched this show begin. We have traveled the entire country in search for commercial farmers. Cassava is now a cash crop in Teso. Farmers from across Uganda have benefited from agriculture. Somebody who is being fish farming, this is an opportunity, a huge opportunity in that the market and the demand is already available. I realized there was potential goat farming. I started with around uh, 30 goats. You don't need a lot of money to start, but rather the heart and determination. Intending farmers is to have a positive attitude and start. Doesn't need the person to have gone to school or to have not gone to school. Possibly keeping is one of the projects that have money. You go home, you come back to a visit the honey. And who said there is no market? Like that fish pond, where it is, I've stocked now 700 fish. What I've seen in agriculture is that the market for produce is there. All you need is you to make a difference. Everywhere you but go, we people go just about majority. the same use, but we thought if uh, we could colleagues. just put some spunk into agriculture. Farming comes in many packages. It takes courage, determination, focus, and above all, the zeal. I have a passion for animals. Stop feeling pity for yourself. Don't blame it on anyone. Stand up and do something. Farming is fun. Join us on this program and let's make the world we live in a better place. You, the viewer outside there, don't you see it is just lively? Art Seeds of Gold, every Saturday, only on NTV. Something bigger than a cricket has entered its hall. Though with Alex Mohanji, the only tiny Muchiga. Do not miss his Chibeda Chakabi Paita. Connect with the dopest show, hottest entertainment news, and home to great hits. Catch up with your favorite celebrity, exclusive interviews, behind the scenes and performances. It's fresh, funky and fan. It's NTV The Beat. Monday to Friday, 5 p.m. with Dougie Nice, Tracy, DJ Brian, Dash, Baby Love and Sheila. When you think show business, think The Beat. They're young, stylish, and with their own sense of fun. How did, how did you come to Kampala? Hey, don't worry. I'm going to be on T Nation. <laughs> they know what they want and go for it. Hey, Michelle, I'm sick. 
They're carefree, opinionated, and intelligent. They're hidden by a covering to avoid temptation, to prevent seduction. Why did you have to bring a baby as your daddy? What are you? Teenagers doing what they love best. I, I see you're not matching. You know the color? They're not matching. Why? On T Nation every Saturday at 11 a.m. Only on NTV. <laughs> And therefore, they negotiated even before from the presentation. I would want uh, uh, them to add exactly what they meant by selected by a DFCU and why you think really they, uh, they took over the bank specifically for DFCU to give to, 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 to DFCU. Two, um, generally, According to your presentation, this bank was closed illegally and uh, unfairly, and the process was unprofessional. That's what you. That's what I, I, I read from the presentation generally. Now, in a statement, why do you think this bank was closed? If, since it was illegal, it was unfair, it was not transparent, it was unprofessional. What do you think? Why do you think it was crossed? Finally, you say that the money that was the Bank of Uganda says was given to Korean Bank. Yes, they say the money that was given to Korean Bank actually never got to Korean Bank. And you state that maybe it uh, landed on some hands. Would you want to clarify on these hands? Why is that stated in the presentation? It's stated uh, on page... Uh, Which money is, by the way? Mr. Chairman, this is on page... Chair, can I help for honor my duties? So on page 32, Mr. Chairman, as shareholders, we want accountability for the money that Bank of Uganda claims it purported to have injected in Ukraine Bank. Yes. So, and uh, in the presentation, actually, I think of the, 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 the writing here, he suggested say this money should have handed on some hands. Do you, maybe if they have an idea, on, on his hands, would want to know the hands of who? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I also wanted to ask about Mera Investments. I have heard now and facts about Mera Investments and the former buildings of Crane Bank. Uh, where are these? Uh, uh, who is now in charge of these uh, buildings that were uh, in major towns of Uganda that? Either you had constructed or you were renting. I would want to know exactly what, about uh, those structures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my first question is about your acquisition of NBC. When you said you were compelled, I wanted to know how you were compelled. Was you put on gunpoint? You, how was this done, really, to compel? Uh, 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 you used to do it. If she got chance, maybe she could do it. But Mr. Chairman, the other one is about the, this animal called the bad book. Sorry? Uh, this bad book. Bad book. I got concerned when the submission was made that it is valued at 570 billion shillings. And the DFCU bought, including the bad book as the claims, at 200 billion shillings. So if bad book was one of the items that was bought by DFCU, which DFCU bought the whole of it at 200 billion shillings, but only this one item was valued at 570 billion shillings, I really get a lot of concern. But what I want but to get... Just one second. Yes. Uh, uh, I think listening to the submission, 
there should be a distinction. What Grand Bank shareholders are saying that the assets sold for 200 billion did not include the bad book, and that the bad book is being held illegally by DFC because it was not part of the P and A. But did I get you correctly? Yes, that's yes, how chairman. I wrote it. It's correct. So they could not have actually their case. If you read, is they did not buy the bad book. No. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That is the concern I had because what they are holding is worth 570 million shillings. They cannot claim it could be theirs when they only paid 200, much less than what they could be having. <laughs> so, but then, that's how I got it from them. I was trying to internalize it further. Mr. Chairman, I want to get from Queen Banker then. In transacting uh, about the bad book, when the, the shareholders have to make their contributions to set it off, the, the balance sheet, could they be having any records or statements of finance or whichever it could be called in the financial terms to the effect of this as some evidence to this committee that they actually have the full right to possess this bad book? Uh, the other one is uh, on page six, and uh, that is paragraph two. When CBL <coughs> was ordered to stop the issuance of letters of great bid bonds, overdrafts, loans, banker guarantees, and various other financial services, to me this is the gist of a banker opening. So what I wanted to ask, what else did they now, were they left with? When they could open Fede uh, transaction, what what could they be <laughs> doing? As they noted, I ask them. Yes, CBL defunct. After stopping you from all this, what did you do when you opened? What what were you doing on, on, on the streets of Uganda as a commercial bank? Maybe to put it the same question different. What business we are doing as a green bank after you had, after been stopped. You had stopped you from lending, issuing letters of credit? What business were you doing as green bank? Yes, thank you. Mr. Chairman, the other one is uh, they, they have spoken about having attracted very strategic investors before this acquisition of Bank of Uganda. I wanted to know whether they had the chance to notify Bank of Uganda that we have attracted the strat very strategic investors, as they put it, and how this was done. Bank of Uganda used to communicate by phone. Did the CBL also use the same method? Did they have meetings with the Bank of Uganda? What kind of correspondence, what kind of interaction did they have with the Bank of Uganda to notify it? that they had actually got very strategic investors to, to iron out the problem. Uh, last, but not least, uh, is about this eight million US dollars. I think it is on page 13. Page 13, they claim, CBL claims, to, at the time of close, CBL shareholder that contributed as a loan of this tune of 8 million US dollars, approximately 27 billion Uganda shillings. What I wanted to understand, how was, was Bank of Uganda way of this? You could have contributed somewhere, but Bank of Uganda, the closer, the acquisition was never informed of, 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 of this. And we could not actually have a verdict against Bank of Uganda on something it was never made aware of. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for. Can I have only one, then they can answer that first round of questions, then we can go to the next. Yes, Agnes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I would like to seek clarification on the issue of the bad book, the way they are mentioning that they want Bank of Uganda to return all the money. They should clarify where is the bad book now. Is it DFCU or Bank of Uganda? There is also another issue that you Green Bank was being run by Dr. Sudi as a family business. That's why you encountered the issues of finances because you ran it as your personal business and a family business purely. You should clarify on that. Let, let me have put those questions uh, answered and clarified on, then I can take over an, another set of questions. Mr. Vidibona, please. Ms. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, members. Allow me to share some of these questions with my colleagues. Um, <coughs> the, uh, Alex Rezida will answer some of the questions. I will also answer, and my other colleagues will answer. Uh, not following the order, but uh, not following the order of the questions, but there is a question of this. After stopping the bank from trading what was left, uh, <coughs> we had all businesses which were running. We had made out money. We had customers who still had confidence in us. We were still depositing. We had for recoveries, which we were doing. And we were also negotiating with these investors. As we have told you, we are in the middle of negotiations with investors when they slumped from this uh, punishment of us. Then finally, we had hope. We thought after this and after the explanation we had given to the bank, there was hope that some of these things may be reversed. <clears throat> That's why we were uh, urging our people to, our, our debtors to pay more money, to, I mean, to recover the debts. Uh, we were negotiating with the, the investors for more money. We were the, negotiating with the Bank of Uganda to relax some of these conditions. So we had activities uh, to do. <coughs> uh, on the shareholders' money, uh, did the Bank of Uganda know that uh, the shareholders had contributed this money. Yes, because Bank of Uganda the ones who directed that this money actually should not be put in the bank. It should be paid to the Bank of Uganda. Uh, on where is the bad book? We have explained that this bad book most likely is with the DFCU. We don't see the argument under which it went to DFCU. Yeah, but Mr. Rirona, without documentation, how would you know? The documentation we have is actually the P and A, which does not talk of the bad book. So, to put it all around, we would want the committee to help us to locate where this bad book is. Yeah, I, I, I think...
afternoon and a very warm welcome to NTV at 1. I am Rita Kanya. Let's take a quick look at the headlines. Owner of the defunct Crane Bank has appeared before the Parliamentary Committee investigating the closure of seven commercial banks. Also coming up, commemorating today's Sita Day. Celebrations to mark the 38th anniversary of the NRA's attack on Kabamba Barracks are underway in Kidgum District. And former Ivory Coast President Laurent Gbagbo has been released to Belgium following his acquittal by the International Criminal Court. Once again, a very warm welcome to NTV at One. I am Rita Kanya. President Museveni has launched a new paint product by Kansai Plascon that will be able to repel mosquitoes. The president who visited the paint factory in Nama the Wakiso district commended the paint company for the new product. State Minister for Health in charge of general duties, Saro Pendi, says the government has approved the new product. Without healthy people, what is our nation? Nothing has given me more purpose and joy than to hold hands with my fellow Ugandans in achieving their goal to rid Uganda of malaria, and that too now. Your Excellency, allow me to inform you that this paint, the ingredient therein was evaluated by our own national bodies National Environment Management Authority, the National Drug Authority, and also internationally by the U.S. government, and got all the clearances to be used in the combination, in combination with the other interventions that I did that talk about in the control, like the indoor residue spraying, the lens. This launch is in a way a sensitization, a sensitization uh, effort to inform Ugandans that we have got this miracle solution where you have a paint doing the work of killing the mosquitoes. So you no longer need to use the, the, the spray. You just paint the wall and the mosquito commits suicide by coming. <laughs> The Parliamentary Committee on Commission Statutory Authorities and State Enterprises has today been meeting the directors of the defunct Crane Bank Limited over their 2016 closure by the Bank of Uganda. The directors led by their former chairperson Joseph Bidibonwa and his vice chairperson Sudir Rupaleria say they were deliberately frustrated by the central bank in mid-2016 leading to their closure. Now in regards to that we are taking you over to Habat Ziwa who is at Parliament and will be connecting to him. Thank you very much, Rita, and the viewers wherever you're watching from. We are still here at Parliament, closely monitoring uh, the activities of Kosase as it is by uh, interrogating officials from Crane Bank, led by the former proprietor, Sudil Rupareria, on how uh, their bank was closed. And according to them, what Bank of Uganda did in 2017 to uh, sell their bank to BFCU was illegal and violated all the laws of Uganda. And they claim that their bank should be uh, reopened. One of uh, Some of the prayers that uh, uh, Sudir Rupareria and uh, some of the board members have put forward include that Bank of Uganda should return the, ba the bad book of written off and provision loans that is being legally collected by DFCU and the bad book according to them, is valued at uh, 570 billion shillings. They also want Bank of Uganda uh, to return the money to shareholders that they advanced to Crane Bank, and they are saying prior to the takeover, their shareholders had lent Crane Bank US dollars 8 million, and after takeover, the, the shareholders also remitted 15 million US dollars. So according to them, they want 
Bank of Uganda to return 23 million U.S. dollars to Ukraine bank shareholders. And they are saying the purpose, of, the purpose for this money was known, uh, was frustrated by Bank of Uganda, being that the purpose of this money was to revive the activities of Ukraine Bank. But since this was not realized, they want this money to be returned to the shareholders. A Ukraine Bank, still through Sudan Repair Area, has asked Parliament uh, to, 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 to carry out a market valuation of the assets and liabilities that were sold to DFCU. And they are saying to date, uh, this is not known to anyone. And uh, they also they also want Parliament uh, 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 to order a refund of the professional fees paid to Max Advocates. These were the lawyers, KPMG, the auditors who valued the assets of uh, Crane Bank and PricewaterCoopers. And they are saying the money that was paid to the lawyers, for example, was illegally paid since these lawyers were conflicted. Those are some of the prayers from Crane Bank, but the committee is still going on, and uh, we are here to hear from the former managing director of DFCU, Juma Chisami, who is also before the committee, and after, after Steve Rupareria and his group, he will also be called to take the floor to explain how DFCU acquired the assets of uh, Crane Bank at only 200 billion shillings. So, Rita and the viewers, that is what is going on here in the committee. To answer the questions which were asked. Chairman, this shows you what the bed book and where it's parked. Because since we're talking about bed book, that is where it's kept off balance sheet in, in a special floor on the if, if you have acquired the bad book, why should it be off the balance sheet? No, but, it's but part of my assets. Yes, so why is it not in your balance sheet if you say you acquired? You have not acquired it. It is parked there. There is no agreement anywhere to say the DFCU has acquired the bad book. Even the P, uh, their uh, you know PNA uh, you know agreements is very clear. Now, central bank in every bank they've sold, they had a separate agreement for bad books. In Crane Bank, there is no separate agreement to say that you know if you recover this money it's part and parcel and it doesn't even form part of the the pn agreement so what is its status this is the whole thing what is it doing and this letter is a further confirmation that it is not in the assets it's not in their uh, part of their purchase it may be it's a very clear indication of, of how to deal with it what it's saying is keep this money of the books, which is completely contravening central bank regulations and revenue regulations. You cannot, as a financial institution, keep anything off book in your, you know, and, 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 and you start collecting money, which means you're collecting mo money from people who are due. It's completely illegal and criminal. Maybe, Chair, the, the, the important thing to note that this compliance accommodation was offered on the same day yes the signing of the PA day and uh, it would have either been part of the PA or they should have been a solicitation or a request for that accommodation so I, I, I wish to know from you as presented it did you find anywhere in the PA that uh, request for or pro Thank you so much, Habat Ziwa, for that update. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees has announced that their key priorities for this year are education and environment conservation. Addressing the media at their offices in Kololo, the UNHCR representative has said that their main key priority will be the emphasis being put in education funding in a bid to boost their poor education attained by refugees in Uganda at the moment. He has further cited rampant tree cutting by refugees, which he says the organization is going to work upon by replacing them. <laughs> Not every week. <laughs> okay. But if we want to be serious about education, 
we have to increase substantially our efforts. Substantially. It means building more schools, recruiting more teachers, also uh, giving a chance for uh, uh, the refugees who have their um, diploma, having an equivalent that allows them, as it is happening, but in an ad hoc manner, as uh, assistant teachers or teachers. Each refugee cuts 20 trees a year, which is slightly less, in fact, than what a typical uh, Ugandan would cut, because they have, they have less resources. So our ambition is to replant, very simplistically in a way, the goal, 20 million trees, because you have more or less 1 million refugees in camps, in settlements, sorry. So multiplied by 20 trees, 20 million trees. We're going to take a short break, but when we return, NTV at 1 does continue. Kweba kamu kapala akatubie. O kweba kamu pampa kapale impia. Pampa kapale impia zesu za Uganda kuwa ni mikutu ogu soka. Ogo kulinogu oku sato huzi ambako. Okunyua no kukale mirundi ya sato okusinge ndala zona. Atati zikiri zogu nyo ngovu kukuna anila mchifuchimu oro mwana onafu no tulo tulu unji. Katiwezili musaizi mukanga. Pampa kapale impia ya galo kweba ka no kuzanya. Airtel, the smartphone network. Sleeping in wet pants? Sleeping in new Pampers pants. New Pampers pants are Uganda's first pants with one, two, three channels that absorb wetness three times faster and does not allow wetness to collect in one place so your baby gets better sleep. Now available in size 6. New Pampers pants love, sleep and play. Amanya Gange, Nze Wavye Ibrahim, Jason. Nazanya Kazanyo, Nempangula. Mkuzanyo kwa wadewo jo echiro, nasobo deo kwata number two, nempa milioni tano. Wetuwaze mula undi tu, ni wangamba number eight, mpangu de milioni aga, habidi. Embele yo ya ntuseko, nasanyo se, last week, nyingiza mu emirundi musamvu. Kati emirundi ya musamvu ejo, mwemuwa dechi, akamu mwako, akamfude omuanguzi wa wiki eno. Kati nga madamu wangi nino kumute lao wano, haka yumba kakori lao mbiziness, uh, kakaduka, mplani um, nko kugula ko wachiri ya kataka. Nembela, nga wachiri nina kwenisoboro ukulimila na ukulundila. Aneka business kanga kadia ka computer training, mbelenga nzira mkuchu. Kuga mazima, super theory, bielanga kuma TV, kuma radio, meseji zeweza kuma simu za dala. Welcome back to NTV at One. I am Rita Kanya. Now, let's take a look at what's trending in regards to social media. 
Social media has been a buzz this morning and this afternoon after it was released by the Daily Monitor that the tourism ministry had planned on putting on attractive women, the Kavi women, as a part of our tourist attraction. Now, a, a comment, just a quote from what the minister of tourism said, we have naturally endowed women we can use to actually promote tourism. Okiru Jonathan does say, hope you don't want to promote the spread of other rare sexually transmitted diseases cause that is what we think I beg your pardon, that is what we think might be coming with that. And as a and study may result to giving health ministry too much work and too many costs as well. Still going on ahead, we have one tweet that comes in from a lady who says the women, actually a gentleman, his John, we say, who says that women activists have been silent and we're going to fill them this month because they're definitely going to have say, to say something. Following that, we have Duncan Mugisha who says, I do not think this is what it takes to promote tourism. It is a dangerous path that will lead to many shameful things being done in the name of tourism. And we have one coming in from a lady. She's called Alice Ruhindi. She says this, are you mistaken? taking obesity for being well my gym has web offers please drop by you guys need help the leaders are clearly misleading you the last time I looked there was no medicine in our hospitals women were dying in childbirth at Mulago hospital and this is what we're going with and lastly also still from a lady we have Banteria G she says disgusting and abuse of our integrity this is madness that has to be stopped and these are only just a few of the comments that are coming in from people on social media a number of them are not happy we have one uh, we have one that came in from Inserica who says that we are simply turning women into tourist attraction sites which is not right do also continue to send in your so your feedback using our social media platforms NTV Uganda on Twitter and NTV Uganda on Facebook as well do you agree with what the Ministry of Tourism is going with now adding Kavi women as a part of the tourist attraction sites within Uganda one would wonder where did the chimpanzees go where did the forests go as well that is what has been trending and continues to trend this morning and this afternoon as well. A section of Miller's, section of Miller's in Imbale have been protesting today, following reports that the association chairperson connived with elements in power distributor Umeme to inflate their power bills. Now, led by their vice chairperson, the Millers say they recently discovered that their bills had been inflated by over 100 million.